When you start TDI, you get this question as to where you want your workspace. By default, this is going to be a folder called workspace under your solution directory. And this is still the root of all relative paths in your solution. The first screen that you see here is the welcome screen. This provides you with quick links for doing things like creating a new project, importing existing config files, or just going to the workbench. There are also links to learning materials and to videos as these become available. All of your work in TDI is organized into projects. You can navigate these here in the TDI Navigator. I'll start by creating a new project. I'll just keep the default location, which will be a folder with the same name under my workspace. The project contains the assembly lines that we'll create, as well as our library of components called resources here. TDI creates a special subfolder to your project, which is called Runtime Minus, and then the name of your project. This is where the config is generated each time you run an assembly line or save your project. This will also be where the server loads the config from. Furthermore, you get a property store, which is named after your project. This points to a file on disk where you can store passwords and other sensitive configuration information that you don't want stored in your config. Notice how the collection path URL has a substitution. If we click on the parameter itself and get up the parameter dialog, text with substitution is being used to set this value. There's a special token here, config.dollarDirectory, which always refers to the folder where the config was loaded from. I'll right-click on assembly lines to create a new one. This will be a simple CSV to XML assembly line. By just double-clicking on the tab here, I can expand this to fill up the entire screen, which gives me more space to do my work. The Options button gives you access to additional settings, including setting up logging for this assembly line. This drop-down controls how the Run button works. Now, whenever you add a component, you're presented with a Choose Component wizard. Here, you can limit your selection list to any type of component or you can use the search here to filter that list and only show those that match the text that you enter. I'm going to call this component read file and then set it to iterator mode. When I click on the next button, it takes me now to the configuration of that connector. Here I can see there's only one mandatory parameter, which is the path itself. And I'm just going to enter people CSV. This means that this file will be located in the solution directory itself. There's also an advanced section where less commonly used parameters are kept. Alt N for the next again, and I'm taken to the selection of the parser. Once I've chosen the parser and click next again, it takes me to configure this parser. At this time, I'm ready to press finish and get back to my assembly line. This button controls the parent for this component where various settings like connection parameters, maps, and hooks can be inherited. Pressing the More button reveals additional parameters, like setting limits for your iterator, or configuring when this component starts up during the assembly line lifecycle. And finally, a Select Inheritance button that opens up a global inheritance dialog, where you can control how the various aspects of this component are inherited. Once my connector is configured, I can then go to the schema area and use the connect and read next buttons to discover information. Well, this doesn't look right, so my parser probably needs to be reconfigured. So I could either go up here to the parser tab and make changes and then retry this. A more convenient option would be to use the data browser. The data browser automatically detects the type of system or connector that I'm working with and reformats the display accordingly. Here, for a stream, I'm presented with the first 5,000 bytes, so I can make a visual verification of what kind of separator I've got in this file. Then I can go to the Parser tab, make the change directly here, and then simply close, reconnect, and read the next line to determine that my Parser settings are now correct. Now I can use this schema area to browse through the data and select what I want. And I'm going to grab the company name, then we'll go down here and we'll get the first name, the full name, internet address, and job title. When we close the browser now, we can see that the input map 
is already in place. The assignments use a form of shorthand, which allows us simply to name an object and then grab, or an entry object, and then grab the attributes in it. There's also auto-completion now in the JavaScript editor. So by pressing control space, or just the dot, it brings up a list of all the attributes that are available. And because it's a job object as well, if I scroll further down, I can see the various methods that are supported. Now the old syntax is also uh, supported in the 7.0 version, so I can do a ret value equals con dot get attribute, as we've done before in TDI. And I can also replace the ret.value with just a return. Or finally, I could just do a get string or a get attribute, and the result of the last statement in the script will be the value of the map. But then it's just as simple to use this shorthand form. Note that you click on the name of a mapping rule to rename it, and you double click on the assignment to open and close the JavaScript editor. So now we'll add a new component, this time to display progress as we're reading through our data. And I'll grab the pre-configured, or the canned script, for dumping the work entry. And then press the Run button here to test it. Now what this does is it has TDI pass the config to the server that we have already running, that's maintained by the config editor. It then instructs it to run the assembly line, and we see all the log output here on screen. Now if I click on the name of any of the components here in the statistics at the end of the assembly line run, it'll bring me back into the assembly line at that component. So let me just click here on the work entry, or the dump work entry script, and I'm back in the assembly line here. So now I'm going to add my output connector. Again, I'll choose a file system. This time I'm just going to call it output. Again, we're going to have to configure it going through the wizard here. And I'll call this file output, drop this in the solution directory as well. And then choose the parser. Now, TDI still has the existing or the old XML parser that we had in version 6. But there is now a new XML parser which can do the same duty plus a lot more. I'll keep the default configuration parameters because that's all I need. Here in the advanced section, you can see a lot of the control flexibility I have, even working with multi-root documents like log style XML. Now to add attributes, I can either click on the add button and select them, including the wildcard here for everything. But I can also click on either the feed or the flow folders and get an overview of all the data moving in and out of my assembly line. And I can drag and drop from here to move those attributes from an input map, for example, to an output map. And notice how TDI converts the input map shorthand assignments to output maps. Now I'll just delete these, and that'll also let me show you how I can do an undelete. So Control z for Edit Undo, and I can even bring back deleted information in TDI now. Now I'll rerun my assembly line again. And with the server already hot and running, I don't have to wait for server startup to see the results of my work. This shortens my try test refine cycles. So I can go back to my assembly line, make any number of changes, and then very quickly run it again to test and make sure everything is working. At this point, I want to go and examine my output file, and I can do that very easily again using the data browser. And that concludes this first video on creating an assembly line with TDI 7.